Hi everyone and welcome back to New Egg TV. This is part two of our three-part how to build a computer series. We have two systems to put together for you guys today. We're going to give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that if you're planning to build a computer at home. And the first step, if you're building a computer, you've got all your parts set, is to make sure you have a good workspace. Make sure you've got nice open area to work with. Make sure it is a non-conductive surface such as a laminate tabletop or a wood tabletop also works great. Make sure it's raised up and out of the reach of, say, small children or pets. And also make sure you have at least a couple hours, preferably three or four, especially if you're a first-time builder, so you can make sure you get everything together before you have to call it for the day. Now, first off, is you're going to want to make sure you have some tools set aside for the job. And fortunately, for most computer builds, all you really need is a Phillips head screwdriver like the one you have here. Now, I'm going to be using a few additional tools today. I'll try to call those out as I show them to you, just so you know uh, if there's anything else you might want to pick up. But the other things that I have here are actually some t uh, cable ties, and there's a few different versions of these. This one is a reusable one that you can cinch down and make different sizes. That's nice because uh, you can undo it and redo it if you have to change anything. This is a standard twist tie, and uh, twist ties work great, but make sure you get ones that are coated because you definitely don't want that metal inside touching any of your computer parts. Finally, we have some zip ties right here. And uh, zip ties are great because you can cinch them down really tight and can get some really good wiring. Just uh, bear in mind that if you use zip ties, uh, you will have to cut them if you ever need to undo that bundle of cables. Apart from that, all I'm, I'm going to really use today is uh, my razor, which I will simply be using to open up parts. So next up, let's go over all the parts for both of our builds. The reason I did two builds for today's video is to show you guys an example of how two very similarly specced systems can be adjusted to your needs to make sure that you can fit within your price range. And both of these builds are based around the second generation Intel Core processor. This is a 2600K. It is based on the 1155 socket. And then for uh, build B, we're actually going to be using a 2500K. Again, very similar processors. It's just 2500K is a step down. It's a little bit less expensive. We'll come back to that because that one is for build B. Let's go over the rest of our parts for build A. Along with our socket 1155 processor, we needed a socket 1155 motherboard. We're going to be going with the ASUS P8P67 Pro for our Memory, we have some Corsair Vengeance. Uh, this is eight gigabytes of Vengeance memory, two sticks, so you can take advantage of dual channel memory. Our case, as you might have seen in the first video, is a Corsair Obsidian 650D. Uh, really nice case, I really like that one, but just an example of some of the parts I've chosen that will really show uh, some of the higher end features that you have. Uh, for our optical drive, we have a Blu-ray combo drive. This is an HP 8-speed Blu-ray reader and DVD burner. For our power supply, very important, we have a Seasonic 750 watt uh, X series, and this is 80 plus gold certified, so it's going to be a really efficient power supply. What am I missing here? Uh, we also have our video card, of course, which is an MSI uh, GTX 570, very nice video card. Uh, for storage, we have a 1.5 terabyte Western Digital Caviar Black, that's a mechanical hard drive. We're going to be using that drive for the combo because we are going to set up a combo for these builds. Uh, but for today, we're also going to be installing an SSD in this build to show you how it works when you have an SSD in tandem with a mechanical hard drive. And this is a PlexTor 128 gigabyte, the PlexTor M2, very fast SSD. Did I forget anything? Yes, I did. I forgot our aftermarket CPU cooler. This is a Cooler, cooler Master Hyper 212 Plus. It's a very popular CPU cooler, and we're going to be using that instead of the stock heatsink fan that comes with our Intel Core i7-2600K processor. And now to go over the parts for our second build over here. Again, this is based on the Intel Core i5-2500K Core I processor. Uh, a very similar processor. It uses the same socket as the 2600K. We're also using a motherboard that also features the P67 chipset. Uh, this time we've gone with the Gigabyte P67X UD3 V3 motherboard. That's the V3 vision of that chipset. Uh, for our memory, we have some G-Skill DDR1333 memory. This is four gigs right here. For our storage, for our storage, we have chosen a Seagate Momentus XT hard drive. This is actually a 2.5 inch hard drive and it's a hybrid. The reason we've gone with this is I wanted to choose something that has a little bit more pep than a standard mechanical hard drive. So we'll show you guys how that one works. Uh, moving right along, our case right over here is a Cooler Master Half 912 computer case. And our video card right here 
is a Gigabyte Radeon HD 6850 video card. Very nice video card there. And the uh, last couple components here are DVD burner, standard light on, a DVD burner right there. And for our power supply, we have another Seasonic. This is a Seasonic S12, which is 80 plus bronze certified. So still 80 plus certified. It is bronze instead of gold, uh, but a little bit less expensive than our 750 watt one that we have for the other build. So for starters today, we're gonna do what's called an external build. That's where you put everything together and do a test boot outside of the case. That makes sure that your components are working because if you install everything first and then you happen to have a defective part, it's really a bit of a pain to try to remove everything. And uh, this way you can just save a little bit of time. So first you're gonna take your motherboard out of the motherboard box. Use your motherboard box to set the motherboard on because this is a non-conductive surface. And you also wanna be able to have an edge right here for installing your video card. Do not set the motherboard on the anti-static bag that the motherboard comes in because the outside of this bag is conductive and you don't want to use that. Once you got the motherboard set up like this, you can go ahead and install the core components, your CPU and your memory, also your video card. Then we're gonna plug in the power to this and we're gonna uh, do a little test boot and make sure that it gets up and running. For starters, we're gonna be installing our CPU and the stock heat sink fan that it came with. Now, before you pull this out of the protective plastic casing, and actually before you pull your motherboard out of the box, you need to make sure of one really, really important safety technique. That is static electricity. If you live in an area, especially an area that's very dry, if you frequently get shocked when you touch a door handle or that sort of thing, make sure you invest in an electrostatic wristband. It has a little piece of metal, you uh, attach it to a large metal object, such as your computer case, will make sure that you have any static electricity discharged. Uh, for today, we're going to be using a old school home builders method, which is to frequently reach over here and touch the exposed metal of our computer case. That'll make sure that any static built up on me is discharged to the case and not to our sensitive computer parts. But for starters, we need to mount the CPU in our LGA socket right there. So we're going to reach down here and disengage this uh, tension arm right there. That will pop up this protective plate. This is a protective piece of plastic that uh, keeps these pins nice and safe in there. And once we have that plastic off, be very, very careful so you don't drop anything onto the pins uh, because you really, really don't want to bend those. Next, we can take the CPU itself and get it out of this little plastic casing. Uh, CPU is delicate, but really mostly delicate on the bottom. So when you're gripping it, make sure you don't touch those uh, gold contacts there on the bottom of the CPU. But you will notice that at either side of the CPU, here and here, there are two little notches. You wanna line those two notches up with the two notches on the motherboard in the socket. There's one on either side. Next thing is to hold the CPU nice and level over the socket and drop it down. You don't wanna drop one side down and then the other. You don't wanna put any pressure on top of the CPU. It, dro it drops down and then it's good to go. This is called zero insertion force because you don't need to push down on that CPU. You lower the tension arm. The plate will hold that in place. Make sure it's hooked on there. This is uh, an LGA 1155 socket, once again, just to remind you folks. You push down the arm, lock it in place, and then your CPU is installed. It's also best to try not to touch the top of the CPU just because oil from your skin can get onto there. Next off, we want to install our heat sink fan, and that's the device that makes sure the CPU stays nice and cool. This is the stock one that comes with the processor. You'll notice on the bottom here are these gray strips. This is called thermal paste. Uh, it's basically material that helps conduct heat from the CPU to the heat sink fan, uh, so it can be exhausted right there and make sure it keeps your CPU cool. Uh, for our purposes, since we're using the stock one, it's pre-applied. But be sure if you're using an aftermarket heatsink fan, and we'll show you that in a few seconds with our other build, uh, that you are using uh, thermal paste because it's not always pre-applied. Just sort of depends on the heatsink fan that you're using. Now this is the power for the fan. Uh, make sure that keeps spinning. And before you install this, make sure you check where your CPU fan header is. Usually it's labeled on the board. If you guys can see that, but right here it says CPU fan, and that's a four pin header that makes sure that it can control the RPMs of the, CP of the CPU fan when it's spinning. Again, this is a typical Intel stock heatsink fan, so it's not too difficult to install. You wanna line up these four uh, dip switches over there, uh, over the four holes on the motherboard. Make sure they're sort of sitting in there. Uh, and since we're doing an external build, this is a little bit more difficult because we have to lift up the side of the board. But you want to make sure that you uh, push down the two opposite each other and then the two opposite each other right there. They'll require a little bit of pressure and they will click into place. One. 
two, three, and four. It gives a little click once it's installed and then your CPU heatsink fan is nice and secured down. If you need to pick up the board after this, you can use this, but make sure you support the board otherwise. You'll notice also when I was pushing down, you could see a little bit of uh, torque on the board there itself, and that's about the most that you ever want to put on it. In fact, since this is a tutorial, uh, that's, that's a good example of about the most that you want to have on there, because any more than that, you really could risk damaging the board. We install, or we plug in, I should say, our CPU's uh, fan header, into the motherboard and now the CPU is installed. Next up is our system memory. We have two sticks to install. Remember this is dual channel which means we want to install two sticks to take advantage of that. And when you're installing your memory for the first time you really want to pop open your trusty motherboard manual. You, manual. You'll be referring to this a few times throughout your build because uh, the slots that you install this memory to do matter. And uh, basically you just want to take a look in here. It will say, it will give you the numbered slots usually. They'll be laid out on the board and it tells you if you're using two modules, you want to install in slot one and slot two. Slot one and slot two are uh, the two white slots that we have there. To install memory, and this is one of the simplest things to install, you'll notice that there is a little notch. It's off-center, so you can't install it the wrong way. Uh, just make sure that you've got that lined up properly. You want to push back the two little securing brackets, drop the memory in, push down firmly. It will snap into place, and the two little brackets will lock in. Do the same thing with our second stick of memory, just like this. And we are good to go. Oop, make sure that's seated all the way down there. Memory is installed. All right, just a couple more things to plug in and then we can do our first test boot. This is our video card. It slots into the PCI Express slot right there. There's only one way to install it. And you'll notice that these two brackets will uh, hang over the side. Uh, now usually when you have this installed in your case and all you really have to do is give it some firm pressure down like that, this bracket will be held up by the side of the case and it bolts down right there. Uh, when you're doing your test build, be pretty careful because this is going to be a little bit loose. You just want to make sure you don't put any pressure on that because you can damage the socket itself. But that's installed. Uh, all we really have left to do now is to unbox our Seasonic power supply here so we can plug in the power connectors to the motherboard and the video card and then we can do a test boot. Now we have three power connectors total that we're going to need to plug in from the power supply just to do our test boot here. Uh, this is the supplemental CPU power connector. This is our 24 pin main motherboard power connector which plugs in right there and then finally we're going to need to use one PCI Express connector and that's just to power our video card. So out these cables over. Again, this is just temporary, so you just want to make sure you get them in place. That one uh, slots in right there. If you're not sure which way to plug it in, there's a little latch on one side. You can line that up with the latch on the motherboard socket, and that will give you a good idea of how these plug in. There's our supplemental CPU power. And then finally, we need to fish out one of our PCI Express power connectors to plug into our video card. Now, I have not plugged in the power to the power supply yet, and uh, I'm going to discharge myself one more time. So last but not least, I'm going to plug in the power for the power supply. I'm going to plug in a HDMI cable from our video card. And then I'm going to short two pins on the motherboard to do a test boot. And I will show you what those are in just a moment. So our CPU and heatsink fan are installed. The memory is installed. Our video card is plugged in. We have the main CPU power and the supplemental CPU, CPU power plugged in and our PCI Express power plugged in to the video card right here. All we need to do is turn this on and how do you do that when there's no case that it's plugged into so you can push a power button? Well some motherboards have a surface mounted power switch and that's very handy to have. This one unfortunately does not. Uh, I'm going to do one thing real quick and that's plug in this speaker to the speaker headers so that we can actually hear our post beep. And the next thing we're going to look for is the power switch. There's just two pins that come out of this front panel connector here. Unfortunately, they are labeled on this little chart right here, so the, the PW right there is power. If you're not sure which they are, reference your motherboard manual. It will have that information in there. I'm going to take a screwdriver, and for just a second, I'm going to short these two pins just like that. And our CPU, I'm sorry, our, our sort of pseudo computer here is going to boot up. We're hopefully going to hear a beep from this little speaker right here. 
Hey, perfect timing. That's a post beep, a single beep. It's the most glorious sound in the world when you're building a computer because it means uh, your motherboard has gone through power on, self-test, everything's good to go. You'll have a quick splash screen here and then you'll see a disk boot failure because we don't have any operating system, uh, hard drive with an operating system installed. But we're good to go. Next thing we can do is actually start installing this hardware into the computer. But first, of course, we have another build to do. So I'm gonna real quick do the same thing with that one. Now, I've got the CPU installed for our primary build, and the main difference between these two setups is that we're using the aftermarket heatsink fan for this secondary build. Now, aftermarket heatsink fan have a variety of different ways that they might mount to the motherboard, but most of them include a back plate like this one, so it's uh, really helpful to mount that prior to mounting the motherboard into the case. Uh, since there's different uh, aftermarket heatsink fans and different ways of doing this, I'm not going to give specific instructions. Actually, we have a video on this product page of how to do that if you're interested. Uh, but for now, I'm going to get this bracket installed and then I'm going to apply some thermal paste. And I'll show you guys how to do that. All right, now that our bracket is installed, you'll notice we have four mounting points for our actual retention bracket. And that actually sits on top just like that. But this is actually going to pop through here on our Hyper 212. And Hyper 212 is going to sit on top of the CPU this way. Now when we install this, we want to make sure that we're going to doing it permanently, or we're planning to do it permanently. Permanently, So take a bit of time to figure out how this is going to be oriented in your case itself. Now, usually this is the back of the CPU on this side, or back of the computer case on this side, and the top of the computer case up here. So popular configurations are to have the air uh, pulling from this side through to the back, or sometimes rotated this way, so it pulls uh, air up and out of the top of the case. Uh, again, this is based on your preference. If you are not sure, most uh, heat sink fans or fans themselves will have a little indicator there uh, indicating which way the fan rotates and which way the airflow goes. With the Hybrid 212, you also have the option of removing this fan, moving it to the other side, for instance, if it were to conflict with your memory slots or if you just wanted to do a different configuration. I'm going to mount it just like this, so it's going to be pulling air from this side of the case and exhausting it through the back. And it's going to line up just about like that. So uh, we should be set up so I can plug in my CPU fan to the CPU fan header right over there. And the next thing I'm going to do is apply the thermal paste. Now this is a very important procedure and there's lots of different schools of thought on how this should be done. What I'm going to be doing is the spreading method. And uh, feel free to disagree with me if you want in the comments, folks. But this is a heat pipe design that actually has contact heat pipes there. And there's some ridges in there. So I want to make sure it fills in all of those little gaps uh, to get the best heat condu conductivity possible. So what I'm going to do is use my thermal paste here to inject about somewhere between a grain of rice and a pea-sized blob of thermal paste there. That's all you need. Do not overdo the thermal paste. And then I'm going to use the old school baggy technique, finger in the bag just like that, to spread this around nice and even as best as I can. Now try to get it smooth if possible. You want to avoid air bubbles uh, at any cost. But generally speaking, once you get that heat sink fan installed on there, uh, it will spread this thermal paste out, fill in, fill in all the gaps, and make sure you have good thermal conductivity across the entire surface of this CPU's heat spreader. All right, that's looking good to me. Next, I'm going to collapse this down so I can install it here. Spread it back out. It's pretty simple to install. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm forgetting an important part of this. When mounting this, you actually do need to remove this fan. <laughs> Can't forget that. OK. That feeds right through there and it spreads out. There's a little uh, poker guy on there that will make sure that it doesn't rotate around too much. You want to set it down flat and even. Try not to put too much pressure on any particular angle of the CPU. The idea here is that if you're putting any pressure on that CPU heat spreader, uh, you want it to be straight up and down. You don't want to angle it at all. So now that this is all lined up, we're just going to tighten down these screws. I'm going to do opposite corners first, and then I'm going to just tighten each one a little bit at a time and then until they're nice, tight down, and uh, the heat sink fan is mounted securely. And that's the last of it. Remember, the idea here is snug but not too tight, because in case you ever want to remove this, you don't want to be backing out and actually uh, unscrewing the bolts on the uh, back plate there.
All right, guys, after the CPU heatsink fan was installed, I've mounted the fan, plugged that into the CPU header on the motherboard. I've also plugged in our MSI Twin Frozer 2 uh, GTX 570 and our two sticks of Corsair DDR3 memory. Uh, just a couple power plugs to plug in here. Uh, I'm really happy with this power supply so far since it is fully modular. You only need to plug in the plugs that you need. Uh, assuming, of course, that I can find, okay. PCI Express, there's that one. So I have simply mounted on our motherboard connector here, our supplemental CPU power for the motherboard, which is right here. Oh, wow, this has a breakaway. And finally, we have two PCI Express power plugs for our power card, or for our video card, I should say. Get those plugged in. All right, and now we should be ready to do the same thing and get a little test boot for this system here. Of course, I do need power for the power supply. And it's over on this side, but just so you guys know, I'm using the same technique with the uh, power switch. I'm just gonna short these two pins. Oh, we should turn the power supply on, of course. And our fans are spinning, so everything's looking good so far. I didn't plug in the speaker, so we're not going to get a post beep, but we should at least get some on-screen information here. And there we have our, our Asus motherboard splash screen is uh, on the monitor here. It's going to once again give us that same message that we don't have a boot drive plugged in, but uh, all of our core components are working for both systems, so time to move on to the actual build inside our computer case. All right, guys, we're ready to start installing into the case. So what I've done with our test build right over here is I've removed the video card. I've also unplugged the power supply connectors that we have plugged in. And uh, the good thing is that we can leave on our CPU and heatsink fan. We can also leave the memory installed and transfer that into the case. So for starters, I'm going to open up our case here so we can take a look inside and start preparing. One of the great things about doing the test build is that you now have a much better idea of the cables that you're going to need to plug in to your motherboard. And you can start getting a, a sort of a conceptualization of how you're going to route the cables in here. So first off, let's uh, remove this little bag of accessories. And uh, we're going to start off with the power supply installation. I like to do that first so I can run the power cables to the points within the case that I like to have them routed to. So here's our power supply. We're going to mount it right down here at the bottom of the case. You'll notice this power supply has an intake fan on the bottom. And uh, there might be some question. Do you point that intake fan down or do you point that intake fan up? But um, for the case with our uh, Corsair case that we have here, we actually have an intake grill at the bottom as well as a dust filter. So really nice to have that there so we can be confident that we can point this down and we'll still be able to uh, get plenty of air in there to the power supply and we'll also be able to pull that dust filter out to clean it every so often. Uh, this case also has a bracket right down here at the bottom. We're going to unscrew that to adjust it over and keep this uh, power supply nice and tight in there. And then finally, at the back, we have four mounting screws that we're going to bolt in here. All right, next up, what I'm going to be doing is mounting my storage drives, uh, the storage drive here and the SSD into the hard drive cages. And I'm also going to be mounting the optical drive into there. So I can show you guys how that works. For a five and a quarter inch drive like this one here, uh, different cases have different methods of doing this, but uh, typically you'll have a panel at the front of the case right up here that you need to remove in order to mount that five and a quarter inch drive to the bay. And uh, depending on the case, again, you'll have different methods of removal. The obsidian just has two little prongs at the back here that you squeeze together. That will pop the front of that plate off and then you can simply slide the drive in to mount it. So this is actually quite simple for the obsidian. Fortunately, that's why one of the additional reasons why I like this case. Once you've slotted it in like this, make sure you have all the cables out of the way. And it's going to lock in place just like that. 
Uh, this is an automatic locking release system here. All you got to do is push on that, it will pop out the little pins and you can unmount the drive if you ever need to do that. Now if you're mounting a five and a, qu five and a quarter inch drive here and you don't have an automatic locking system, you're going to need to take at least two bolts on either side, bolt it in here, and then also flip around to the opposite side of your case and put two bolts in there. A lot of times people for optical drives, since they do spin up, like to do that anyway, but uh, for our purposes here we're just going to go with the automatic latching system. Next up is going to be our two drives. We have our solid state drive and our hard drive, three and a half inch and two and a half inch. Both of these are going to fit in these removable hard drive trays. So starting with our three and a half inch drive, the installation here is pretty simple. We just snap on one end and the other end snaps around just like that. Make sure those little pinholes are in the side of the drive and it's mounted in the bracket. Then we can just drop it in like so. Now, uh, depending on what case you're using, you always want to think ahead a little bit and make sure that you've accounted for your serial ATA data and power connectors because after you've mounted these drives in there, you are going to need to plug these in. For our Corsair case that we have here, I know that I can remove the other side of the case and I'm going to have a nice clear access to that. But if you don't have that capability, you might want to consider routing the, those cables beforehand to make sure that you don't have uh, drives mounted into the case with, uh, without the ability to plug the cables in. And our SSD is mounted to the bracket and just like the 3.5 inch drive, drops down and snaps into place. I am now just about ready to drop in the motherboard, processor, and memory, but one last bit of forethought here. We have a bunch of cables that are coming from the case, and these all, for the most part, need to be routed and plugged into the motherboard. Now, a lot of these, such as this uh, little connector, these connectors here are front panel connectors. They enable the front panel items on the case, such as the power and reset button, as well as the little lights that turn around and that sort of thing. So these we're going to need, need to route down to the bottom of the motherboard where they plug in. We might also have a few other items. For instance, this case has a serial ATA uh, dock right up here on the top. So we're going to need to plug in a power plug to that. We're also going to need to plug in a data cable to that, which is right here. So we want to consider that. Finally, we might have some additional items on the front like USB ports. Uh, we might also have a front panel uh, audio header. So this is, for instance, the HD audio header. That's going to route around to where the uh, high definition audio plug on the motherboard is. And then finally we have these. These are USB 3.0 pass-throughs. For about the last year or so, uh, there, have not, there was not a standard plug on the motherboard to plug in front panel USB headers, such as this one right here, which is the standard plug for a USB 2.0 header. Now, what these are made to do is actually pass through the back of the case, come out, and then plug into those ports on the back of the motherboard. Uh, if you're lucky, you might be able to get your hands on something like this, which is an, an adapter. You can plug that in, whoops, plug that in just like that. That converts it to your USB 3.0 front panel header. You can plug that right into your motherboard. If you don't have one of those, you will want to make sure that you're able to route these cables back through the back of the case and then be able to plug them in. So for now, I'm going to set all these aside and I'm going to go ahead with the motherboard mounting. Now the motherboard mounting is a bit of a delicate procedure, uh, but the one thing that you want to make very, very sure of is all of these little points on the motherboard itself. These are called motherboard standoffs. You're going to want to pay very close attention to where these motherboard standoffs are. These are tiny brass screws. They bolt into the, mother into the tray on one end, and then this other end will have a, a bolt area where you can bolt through the motherboard to secure it to the case. Not only does it secure the motherboard to the case, but it also grounds the motherboard. But you only want the motherboard to be grounded right at these mounting points on the motherboard itself. So first you want to take a look at the motherboard, find out where all of your mounting points are, and make sure that the standoffs you have mounted in the case match up with all of those. If you have to, it's okay to make a paper diagram to find out exactly where all those are. Because the worst case scenario is to have a standoff poking up somewhere on the board that is not a point where the mounting point is. That will short the board, that will cause some major damage, and that is one of the most common mistakes made by new PC builders. The other thing to make sure of before you drop the motherboard in is that you have your input-output shield installed on the back of the case. This is a little shield that lines up with all the plugs on the back side of the motherboard, and simply you just have to make sure that you have it set up the right way. The audio is usually at the bottom and you connect it here to the back and you pop it into place. Sometimes it takes a little bit of pressure but these things are difficult to damage too bad so just apply pressure to all four corners until it snaps into place 
and then you can drop in your motherboard. So here's our motherboard and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine mounting points for the motherboard. Fortunately, our case is actually already set up for standard ATX mounting points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Our input output shield is installed, so we're going to drop this into place. We line it up like so. Make sure those input outputs on the back are set up. And we might need to give it a little bit of push towards the back panel. And it drops into place. Our bolts are lined up. We're going to start with some opposite corners here. Again, the, uh, the rule of thumb when mounting the motherboard is you want these bolts to be snug, but not too tight. Those standoffs on the motherboard can be unbolted themselves. And if you tighten these down really tight, wait, I should do what I said I was going to do. If you tighten these down too tight, uh, then when you try to back them out, you might back the standoff out as well, and you want to try to not, try to avoid that if possible. All right, so there's one in the corner. We'll switch over to the top corner up here, and then we'll proceed with the rest of them. One last thing to mention, uh, we're going to be able to route a lot of our cables behind the motherboard tray here. Now, if you don't have that capability with the case that you've chosen, uh, you might want to take some extra time to consider this motherboard plug, which is right up here, if you remember, the supplemental CPU power. That can be one of the tougher ones to get to, especially if your uh, power supply is mounted at the bottom. So you can actually route that cable behind the motherboard in some situations, but just a little bit of extra uh, forethought to consider there. Now, believe it or not, guys, at this point, we actually have seven of eight of those vital PC components installed. Uh, the CPU, memory, and motherboard, one, two, three, power supply, four, the case, five, uh, our storage drive, six, and our optical drive seven. The only thing that's left is our video card right here. And we're actually gonna wait till last to install this because it can make it a little bit more difficult to reach some of these important ports like our SATA ports there as well as our front panel connectors down there at the bottom. So this section is all gonna be about cable management and routing. What we wanna do is see what we need to plug in, where we need to plug it in, count out those cables from the power supply going over to the things that need power and also the items up here that need to have data connections running down to the motherboard. So for starters, I'm going to connect all of my case cables, and I've done uh, hopefully a decent job of separating them all out here. Now the first thing that you will definitely need to do on this section of the build is remove the other side panel of your case, because you're going to need to get to the back of it as well as the front of it, and we'll flip this around a few times to show you what's what. Now fans are somewhat unique when you're plugging them in for a case. You have two options. You can run power from the mother or from the power supply directly and plug the fans in, in which case the fans will just be on and stay on. Uh, some cases, like this uh, case that we have here, have a fan controller. So this actually is a little power plug that you plug in uh, to the power supply, Molex plug, and then you can plug all your fans in here. And then there's a three-way switch on top of the case that you can use to turn the fans to low, medium, or high. The final option for plugging in fans is to plug them directly into the motherboard. And a lot of motherboards have little three-pin headers like this one. Some motherboards have four pin headers, which are known as PWM headers, that give you a little bit more control over the fan. If you plug them directly into the motherboard, then you will be able to go into the operating system to adjust the fan speed. Uh, but again, you might also prefer the manual control if you have a fan controller built in, or you can actually purchase an add-on fan controller. Uh, since we have that fan controller built in, I'm gonna plug all three of our fans, the one in the front here, the one on top here, and the one on the back, into our fan controller, then we have, we'll have one extra plug here in case I want to add on a fan in the future, and that will allow us to use that switch on the top, top to manually control them. So I'm going to start routing these cables through here. Uh, mainly I'm going to push them through back here and then uh, out here where they need to come through to plug into the motherboard. And in just a few minutes I'll show you guys the results of my work. And last but not least are our USB 3.0 headers, and these are the ones running from the front up there. We can plug these into the two USB 3.0 plugs on the back of our motherboard. So I've routed those along the top of the case, out this little hole in the back, and I can actually plug these in already right here. So now that will enable our two USB 3.0 ports on the front of the case. So I've routed all three case fan plugs uh, down to this point here. Plugged in one, plugged in two. And number three, I'm going to tuck all these back away and tie them down behind the motherboard tray. So I'm passing these cables through this gap right up here behind the motherboard tray and feeding them out right through this grommet down here right next to their motherboard plugs. Now if you notice these mother motherboard headers, usually they are labeled, but this is a point where you definitely want to keep your motherboard manual handy. For instance, it is a very bad idea to plug a USB header into a firewire port. 
Uh, most of these are keyed, so you'll notice there's one little plug there that uh, is missing a pin, so you can only plug them in one way. But there, now our USB 2.0 front panel is connected. This is our HD audio connector, which feeds right over to this HD audio plug over here. Again, this is keyed. It's got one missing, one missing pin, but it's a different pin than the USB connector, so you can only plug that in one way. Now our front panel mic and headphones are connected. And finally, we have our power, power switch, reset switch, and front panel lights. And this typically is the most annoying part of the computer to plug in. You'll notice these are all individual little pins, and they all have to plug into these pins right there. ASUS, for their motherboard, has a unique little feature. This is called a Q connector. Just makes it a little bit easier. You can plug all of these into this little block, and then you plug this little block into the uh, motherboard port assuming you have it lined up, of course. And that just makes it a lot easier to plug and unplug all these individual little strands. And finally, we have our FireWire header, the 1394 plug right there, and it's going to plug into the black port right down here in the corner. All right, guys, we're getting really, really close to being done. Last but not least, we're going to be routing power cables and data cables. And uh, let's go over, first of all, the cables that you already saw us use in the test build. Uh, the two motherboard power connectors right here, the 8-pin EPS and the 24-pin main motherboard power. We're also going to be plugging in this cable, which gives us a couple PCI Express power plugs, and that's for the video card, which we have yet to plug in. And then finally, we need power and data for our drives up here. Now, there's two types of power plugs that are out there today for uh, plugging in computer uh, hard drives and optical drives. One is a serial ATA plug. It looks just like this one. It's a long flat plug. It's uh, got an L-shaped bracket, so you can only plug it in one way. The other one is a legacy plug, which has uh, been around for a lot longer. This is called a Molex plug. It's four pin, and uh, it plugs in pretty simply, just like this one. It sort of has a couple rounded corners again, so you can only plug it in one way. Now, in checking out all of the plugs that we need for this uh, computer, for all of our drives, up here we have a serial ATA optical drive. We also have that serial ATA plug, so we can put uh, our... Um, our drive bracket up there at top, and we have one Molex plug. Also, for these two drives here, they're both serial ATA. So, since this is a modular power supply, we can choose the cables we need, and we have a couple cables here that have three serial ATA plugs on them each. Now, we do have this one pesky Molex plug, so what we would need to do is plug in uh, one of these little adapters to the power supply that gives us a Molex plug. But, since I work at Newegg, I was able to go over and uh, requisition one of these. This is just a simple serial ATA to legacy Molex adapter. That's going to allow me to use the three plug cable, use one of the adapters on there for my three plugs at the top. Second cable here is going to go to our two drives here and then we're going to have one extra plug there. Finally we have our data cables. These are serial ATA revision two cables and we're going to route these up to our optical drive up at the top. I'm going to use the second one to plug in our uh, mechanical hard drive. And then we have two Serial ATA Revision 3 cables, which are nicely labeled in white. Um, with these plugs, what I'm going to do is route one over to our SSD. The second I'm going to plug in and route over there, but I'm just going to leave it there in case I ever want to add a drive in the future. I want to have the most speed possible. And if you're curious, I'm going to be plugging these into the white port here, which is the Serial ATA Revision 3 port, which is controlled by our P67 chipset. And that's going to be the fastest connection possible for, these serial, or for the SSD. Last but certainly not least is our video card, and I'm going to be installing this into the uppermost PCI Express slot. Uh, the connector is right here. Once it's mounted in, it just slots into place, and then you're going to want to secure it on the bracket here with the two thumb screws, or you might have actual Phillips head screws, depending. So I want to take the uppermost PCI Express slot and come back here to these two PCI Express protection panels on the back. We want to remove two of these because it is a two-slot card. Sometimes these are tightened down pretty tight. No worries, we have a screwdriver. That 
that's all for that. Now we take the card. If it's got a protective covering on the PCI Express bracket, be sure to remove that first. We can leave the ones on these slots just to protect them for now. Line it up with the bracket. Just apply firm pressure to socket it in place. It'll snap in. If you need to remove it, there's a little, a little uh, panel that you need, or little tab that you should push down on right there at the top that will allow you to pull that out of there. And now that's in place, we just want to mount these two thumb screws. I'm just going to put one in for now to hold it in place. And then we have two PCI Express power connectors here that we need. I've routed these through from our power supply. We'll just bend them around like that and plug them in. And now everything from this computer is plugged in. We could boot it up if we wanted it to. Uh, real quick, let me just flip this around because you might notice this, uh, this whole front area here looks pretty nice and clean. If we flip it around, the back is, uh, well, it's a bit of a hot mess right now, but that's okay. Uh, we have a de decent amount of space here once we get the panel back on, but for now what I'm going to do is uh, tie these down wherever possible. I'll use some zip ties, use some twist ties to get these compressed as much as we can. And from there, we can put the side panels back on and then we can do a test boot. Now I think we're about ready to boot this up for the first time. The moment of truth is at hand. But first, a bit of PC building superstition. Never put the side panel onto the computer that you've just built for the first time before you boot it up and make sure it works. If you put the side panel on first, it'll never boot up. I won't hold your breath. Okay, now everyone hold your breath. Fans are spinning. We just need uh, some magic information to appear here on the screen. Little Asus splash logo, there we go. Computer is up and running. Next step is to be installing the operating system and getting this all, whole thing configured. And that will be the topic of video part three. And I think that pretty much wraps it. No, no. Oh yeah, there's another computer to build. Let's do that. Well, folks, that is going to wrap it up for today's video, and my hat is off to those of you who have stuck it out and watched the entire thing. We're definitely trying to be detailed and thorough, not short and concise. But a few closing pointers. First of all, we're going to have some helpful links for you guys down in the video description. Uh, links to Newegg, of course. We're going to link you to our combo store page so you can check out some of the combos we have available. We're going to put some combos together that are similar, if not exactly, to the specs that the, of these two systems that we've put together here. As time goes by, we might update those because parts tend to go end of life and we have to replace them and update them. Also, if you enjoyed today's tutorial and you'd like to find out more about computer building parts and accessories, please subscribe to our Newegg TV YouTube channel. And finally, stay tuned for part three, where I'm going to be installing Windows on both of these uh, computers you see behind me here and going through the general setup procedures, such as installing drivers and getting a few helpful programs installed so your computer is good to go. For Newegg TV, my name is Paul. Thanks again for watching today's video, everyone, and we will see you next time.